Hi everyone, uh, thank you for welcoming he me here. My name is Joe and I'm so glad to be in Colorado because it really reminds me of where I grew up and that was on the eastern seaboard way across the country where there are a bunch of trees and I love trees. Right now I live in a desert and it's full of rocks and dirts and I really miss this sort of landscape. And even though the humidity, there's no humidity so I've been kind of dealing with the bloody noses but it's worth it for the trees. And you know, in my childhood, I loved being around trees. I lived on acreages, I lived on top of a big hill, and I only had two neighbors. And these neighbors, I mean, I couldn't see their house from my house. There were trees everywhere. And one of these neighbors was an elderly couple who eventually moved out of their house. And I took advantage of it, because I was a kid, I wanted to go explore. And I found a place that I found so much peace in. And I, I was just wondering with you guys, do you have a place that you go to to find peace? Maybe it's your car after work. Maybe it's your bed. Maybe it's a room in your home. Maybe it's a spot on the street that you like to go and walk and sit or stand. I want to tell you about this refuge, this place of protection, this place I felt security in. And it was a bunch of hedges. There were a bunch of trees overhead. And these hedges, the neighbors had cut into a little maze. And I loved this maze. And it was becoming overgrown because they had left. But I still loved it because it was so natural and it was fun. It was like every single time I was on this path, I was thinking, oh, what sort of new gift am I going to get today? And sometimes deers would come through and I would think, wow, I'm in nature. And my favorite part of this path was at the very end, it ended up in this big circle. And I would come in the circle and there was a big rock in the middle and I would just sit there. And I would just spend like hours sitting there. Sometimes it was with my Game Boy or my DS, but eventually <laughs> I just like to sit there. And let me tell you, that was a very fun time. Um, this place of security really reminded me, I was reminded of this place. I had not thought about this place in years until I had read this scripture. And if you'll open your Bibles to me to Matthew 7, this is the end of the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Praise to him. This is how he ended his most famous sermon. He talked about a path that we all have, that we can walk on with him and feel security uh, from. And so before I just read the word of God, I just want to say a short prayer. Lord, I just pray that your word would convict us today. And Lord, I mostly just pray that we would be broken by it and just realize how much we need you. In Jesus' name, amen. And so we're opening up here to Matthew 7, and we're going to start in verse 13. Just going to read one by one to start. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who go through it. Do you guys see what it's saying here? It's not saying there are many narrow gates. It's saying the narrow gate. There's one gate to go through. And then it says many go through what, what Jesus calls the road to destruction. So we are presented with two different paths, a narrow gate and the road to destruction. And we're sort of being called to make a choice. And today, everyone, I want to call you to make a choice. Which of these paths are you going to go on? And when I read this, he doesn't really elaborate yet on what is past the narrow gate. It's sort of tantalizing me. And I'm thinking, man, what is past this narrow gate? Because he talks about the road to destruction. He says it's broad and it leads and it's the gate is wide and it's the road is broad and it leads to destruction, but he just says enter through the narrow gate to start. And so I can imagine the thousands of people that are sitting in the hills listening to him thinking, what narrow gate is he talking about? I mean, what is this guy talking about at all? But he does not leave us hanging. And he tells us in the next verse, how narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life and few find it. So Jesus here is connecting a narrow gate Two, he calls it a difficult road. Why do we need this road? Why should we go down this road at all? Because Jesus said, I mean, it's a good reason. But I want to implore you all to look into your heart and realize why you need Jesus' road. We are all born with a depraved nature. We love sin. And the Bible says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so we need Jesus' reconciliation to be able to be with him in eternity. And I've been met with this sort of problem before. 
with this idea of separation from God or hell in eternity. And they say, well, God is love. So how can he be mean to me? But I just want to introduce this concept to you that radically changed my understanding of God's holiness. God's holiness and his wrath and judgment are two sides of the same coin. Because he is the very standard of goodness and holiness, it necessitates his wrath and anger towards the unholy. And so we need to be reconciled to him through this path that Jesus lays out. And we're not saved, everyone, we're not saved because the Romans and the Jews hated Christ and put him on an old tree. We weren't saved because they stuck a spear in his side. We're not saved you know, because he wore a crown of thorns that pressed in on his scalpel. I can't even imagine the pain he must have been going through blacking in and out. I, I don't know how nobody else could have done it but the Lord. And we are saved because, sorry, we're saved not because of the circumstances around the cross. We're saved because of who was on that cross, and that was Jesus Christ. He's the only person that could have taken that sacrifice that we needed. In fact, it says in the book of Isaiah that it pleased the Lord to crush him, to bruise him. It actually says punish him severely in some translations too. I mean, there's no one else that could have fulfilled the covenant with God that originally he sought out to have with his people than Jesus, because no one except for Jesus has lived a sinless life. And if you meet anybody that claims to live a sinless life, they're lying. And the cross, it does show this love that the Father has for us. You know, he, he wanted us to be reconciled to him and be with him in eternity. But really, the cross is showing how depraved you are. It's not just his love. It's also your nature. You are depraved. This is what was necessary. I needed to send my only begotten son to die on a cross and be resurrected. That is the only way that sins could be paid for. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And friends, how are we supposed to respond to this? Jesus put it very simply in the gospel of Mark. He said, repent and believe the gospel. And so friends, today I just implore you to repent and believe the gospel. Turn away from your sin nature and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ that he came to save you. I really am interested by this word in verse 14. If you would look at it with me again, it says the road is difficult. It doesn't say the road's easy. It says the exact opposite. It says the road is difficult and few find it. Right beforehand, he says many go through the broad road to destruction, but then he compares it in the next verse with few finding this difficult road through the narrow gate. And friends, I just want to point out that the Bible also says this. It says that your flesh desires what is against the spirit and the spirit desires what is against the flesh. I can't believe it says this. It's so clear. I praise God for his clarity in his word. It says that they oppose each other so that you do not do what you want. You don't get to do what you want. I mean, what is our standard response in popular culture when somebody says, you know, can I, can I do this? I mean, I've said it many times. I just go, yeah, man, do what you want. Whatever. It's up to you. That's not the Christian walk. That's not what it means to walk with Jesus. That's not the difficult road. The difficult road isn't just succumbing to culture and saying, do whatever you want. It's do what Jesus wants. And so we need to cling to him. We need to cling to his commands and his promises and just remember them and store them up in our hearts like treasure so that when we're faced with difficult situations where we want to say, ah, do what you want, man. I'm not going to speak out against this. I'm not going to take action against this, even though I know it's wrong. We're reminded by the word of God and what he's commanded us to do. And that's our only defense against our sin nature, because let's be honest, without God coming down to meet us, we could have never met him fully. And I've also heard this in popular culture. It said, you should just follow your heart. Just do what your heart tells you. No big deal. Just don't think about it. Do what you want. Do what your heart tells you. I mean, do you know that the prophet Jeremiah said that your heart is deceitfully wicked? It's deceitful above all else. I mean, it is actively tricking you. It is deceiving you. And 
this deception is something we fall into all the time. Me included. This is something that as I'm walking through the narrow gate on this difficult road, I'm constantly having to have Jesus reveal parts of my heart that are deceiving me into thinking, oh, you're doing the right Christian thing. And then the Lord says, actually, I don't want you to do that. And I have to say, oh my gosh, why did I do that to begin with? It's because I was deceived by my heart. So don't follow your heart. And I just want to move on to the next verse here. Jesus continues, and he says in verse 15, Be on your guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. You'll know them by their fruit. Jesus, again, is drawing a comparison. We had a narrow gate and a wide gate, and we had a difficult road and a broad road, and we have ravaging wolves under sheep's clothing. And implicitly, we're comparing that against the sheep, the true flock of Jesus that are following Jesus as their shepherd. And so Jesus is constantly making this comparison by them. And he says this, he says, you will know them by their fruit. Other versions say you will recognize them by the fruit. This, isn't, this is something that you are actively doing yourself. The Christian life is not hands off. You are not sitting there just going along, walking along a path. Oh, I know Jesus. I don't have to do anything about it. You are called to take action to follow his commands. And he says here, you will know them and recognize them by their fruit. And I mean, we shouldn't be afraid to call it out when we see it. When we see bad practices in professing Christians, we should not be afraid to call it out because the main way that we're going to receive correction in this world, other than through the word of God, is through our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so if you see your brother and sister in Christ that professes faith in Jesus, you know, um, giving off bad, um, bad fruit, they're doing things that aren't in line with God's commands, don't be afraid to tell them. And our culture is so afraid to do that. I mean, we are constantly worried about, oh my gosh, am I offending this person? Is this offensive? What if, I need to make sure everything is just perfectly above board and Nobody could possibly get upset about what I'm saying, but that, again, is not what the Christian life about is about. Jesus will take you as you are, but if you walk with him, he wants you to change and conform to his commands into what he wants for you in his life, in your life. <clears throat> the Lord is going to correct you and rebuke you if you are truly his, and there's no way you're going to escape it. You're going to be constantly reminded, don't do this. Don't say that. Please. Change your ways. Change your thinking. Love this person. Forgive this person, even though your heart says, no, I don't want to. Remember, the spirit and the flesh are opposed so that you will not do what you want. And so we just need to cling to Jesus Christ. We just need to cling to him. I mean, have you ever seen those action movies when you'll see a building exploding and there's a helicopter and the, the hero runs and jumps and grows onto the bars and you're thinking, is that real? Like, could I, could I do that? I've thought that. Like, I really want to try that, but I, that's beside the point. I mean, we, that is the picture of us clinging to the Lord. We need to not have this passive, like, oh, you know, I'm just, oh, it's kind of, kind of in my grip. I'm not really worried about it. We need to be holding on for dear life, clinging on to Jesus Christ and his commands, because that's the only way we're going to get through this world uh, with peace. That's the only way. In fact, um, this is just such a not pleasant thought, but we, in the same way that we are afraid to offend people, we want to be friends with the world. We want to be friends with people. We want to say, we don't want to ever turn anybody away and say, oh, I can't be your friend. But do you know what the book of James tells us? It tells us that friendliness to the world is hostility to God. And so being friends with the world makes you, I can't believe how strong this, I can't believe how strong this language is. It's in the written word of God. It's true. You are an enemy of God if you are a friend of the world. I don't want to be an enemy of God. Is there anyone here who wants to be an enemy of God? I don't think it would go well for you. He's all powerful. Don't try it. Um, we just need to cling to the Lord Jesus Christ. We just need to cling to who he is and his commands. And when we need to say hard things, we should say them. So don't be a doormat. It's so easy to just get run over in this culture and just kowtow to whatever's going on and think, oh, 
I'll just let them do what they want because it doesn't really affect me. I mean, it is sin to know that something's wrong and not do anything about it. The Bible tells us that, and we, we do not want to be doormats. This eternal place that the Lord is talking about here at the end of his sermon, through the narrow gate, on this difficult road, this place is conditional in eternity. Just because you accept the Lord Jesus Christ and you say a prayer, and you say, Lord, I give you my life. Just because you say that once, that doesn't mean that you're going to be in the presence of God for eternity. It is conditional on you following the will of the Father. And Jesus expands on, talks ex explicitly about this to end his sermon. So friends, I want to implore you today not to only just cling to the Lord Jesus Christ, but to do the will of the Father. Do the will of God and follow his commands in this world. Let's read it together. This is how Jesus ended his sermon, again, this is Matthew 7. We're going to pick it up. Um, we're going to pick it up in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many. Do you see that word again? Many. Many are on the road to destruction. Many will say to the Lord, Lord, Lord. Not just Lord. This person saying, Lord, 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 I'm so pious. Don't you see me? I casted out demons in your name and I, oh, I just did everything for you, Lord, Lord, Lord. You know what Jesus said to him? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. That was probably the worst thing that you could ever possibly hear. Jesus on the day of judgment telling you, actually, get away from me. I have no idea who you are. You broke the law, leave. And you're, I mean, that's it. And so friends, I just want to implore you again, cling to the Lord Jesus Christ so that this will not happen to you on the day of judgment. You want to make sure that your confession holds true on the day of judgment. And you really need to examine yourself. The Bible tells us to test yourself in the faith and to examine yourself. And you need to think, again, do you think that you're saved because you said a prayer? Or maybe your youth pastor when you were five years old told you that you're saved. Or maybe your pastor now told you, yes, you've been saved. Friends, that's not how you know that you're saved. Let me just share with you some shocking statistics from Americans that were polled on their beliefs. This is from the Arizona Christian University, and they put out a poll every year called the American Worldview Inventory. And in this poll, recently 70% of people claim to be a Christian. Do you remember what Jesus said at the start of this? He said, few will find the difficult road that leads to life. Is 70% few? I don't think so. I think many are on the road to destruction. And so there's this possibility that 70% of these people, not all of them are really saved. And many of them could be deceived by their own heart. And these are, these are totally terrible statistics. I hate that I even have to say this. 58% of this subgroup that claim to be Christians said that the Holy Spirit is not a real living being. Can you believe that? 58% of this group that calls themselves Christians says the Holy Spirit is not a real living being. And 44%, only 44, not a majority, who describe themselves as born-again Christians said that Jesus, the minority of born-again Christians said Jesus did not live a sinless life. They said that Jesus lived a life with sin. Yes, incredible. I mean, what is going on in our culture? Why are we so deceived? I mean, what is happening? We are obviously in a spiritual crisis. And we need, I mean, we need to pray into it. And we need to follow the Lord's prayer. I mean, one of his only prayer requests in the Bible, he, he prayed for more laborers to be sent out into the fields of harvest so that those ordinary people could raise up um, true believers in Christ and other laborers for Christ, we can't do it all alone. We need to pray for these people because 
this crisis of spirituality is just devastating and nobody likes being deceived by others or themselves. And we just need to mostly cling to the Lord Jesus Christ, his promises, what he has told us, trust in his promises. Yeah. Get in the word. Seriously. Would do you believe these 58% would still say that the Holy Spirit is a real living being if they read the word of God? I don't think so. It's very clear. I mean, in the book of Acts, Ananias gives a false price for a piece of property. And Peter says that you were led to lie to the Holy Spirit by Satan. I mean, how can you lie to something that isn't a living being? I can't lie to this pen. I can lie to a person, but I can't lie to something inanimate. And the Holy Spirit is very obviously a real living being. I mean, we just need to get in the word to be able to combat this nonsense when we're faced with it. And I want us all to not just look at others and think, wow, there's so many lost people. I'm good. Look inwardly. How has Jesus affected your life? Is Jesus the center of your life? Or is he just an accessory that you bring out on Sunday or Wednesday? Seriously, is he an accessory of your life or is he the center of anything? Is there anything in your life that Jesus is not the very center of? Because that is a problem. He is the Lord, your shepherd, and he will guide you in a righteous way. And so I implore you to trust in him and just cling to him. Like you're like there's no like there's no building below you and there's a helicopter flying in the air. You need the Lord. I mean, he's the only way you're getting out of this mess. And I just and let's look now at the end of the chapter, <clears throat> how Jesus ends his sermon on the mount, start picking up in verse 24. That's Matthew 7:24. Again, Jesus presents a choice. He says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house. Yet, it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew, and pounded that house, and it collapsed. It collapsed with a great crash. We have a narrow gate. We have a wide gate. We have a difficult road. We have a broad road. We have good fruit and bad fruit. We have those who do the will of the Father and don't do the will of the Father. And Jesus ends his sermon by giving us another dichotomy, another choice. A strong foundation or a weak foundation? What have you built your life on? Are there parts of your life that you haven't fully founded on the Lord Jesus Christ? Because you need to cling to him. That is the only way that when storms come, when winds blow, your foundation, your house, what you build in your life will stand up. It's the only way. <clears throat> Just acknowledging Jesus as Lord, we see here, is not enough. You need to do the will of the Father. Just saying, I know Jesus is Lord. That's not your ticket into eternity to be in the presence of God. I mean, Satan would say Jesus is Lord. He's not going to be in the presence of God in eternity. Have you deceived yourself? I mean, really, we need to ask ourselves this question because it is so easy to fall off this difficult road because it is difficult. Let me give you an example. If there's any football fans in the room, you know the Super Bowl is coming up this Sunday. And what if I told you that my plan to get into the Super Bowl was because I knew the quarterback. I knew the quarterback of the Chiefs. His name's Patrick Mahomes. It, uh, my plan is to go up to the gate agent and say, I know Patrick Mahomes. I'm not getting in the game. But if that gate agent had a book, a list of names, a book of names maybe, and it had my name on it, I might get in. And so I just want to ask everyone here, do you need to confess to living a cultural Christianity, a false Christianity? Really ask yourselves if you need to do this. And I just want to call, I just want to ask that if you feel like you need to do this, you need to know Jesus, that you would surrender yourself and take a posture of prayer right now and call out to him so that you would cling to him and vow to walk along this difficult, narrow path with him and be in his presence in eternity. And even if you don't completely, if you, if you don't know the Lord at all, 
If this is the first time you've heard that he's died and risen again for your sins, I'd like to challenge you to come up front and all of us will pray for you so that you will know God and you will enter through the narrow gate and you will be saved. And so I just want to end us in prayer. Lord, I just pray against the fear of man that you say, say entraps us in the Bible. It's, it's trapping us, Lord, when we're afraid of what other people think. And I just pray that you would rebuke in all of our hearts and minds this false cultural Christianity that is running prevalent through our world and that you would replace it with a deep hunger to want to follow Jesus, that, Lord, our thoughts would be, I want to follow Jesus. And God, just please move among us because you are our only hope. Amen.